the uh, workshop today is on lecture capture and we're going to talk about it in terms of uh, turning it on its head and so what we're looking at are some ways that you could possibly um, have uh, components of lecture uh, outside of the classroom and we have um, uh, Ben McFarlane here with us today who has a uh, an extreme example of that when he's going to talk about his experience of, of lecture capture on a snow day since we had a, sn a few snow days uh, over the Thanksgiving break. Um, the uh, snow day was of course the Monday before Thanksgiving. It was the day when it wasn't snowing that bad and I went out to my bus stop because I don't like driving in the snow even if it's a couple flakes. And the bus never came and uh, then I walked back home and I said to myself, well I'd like to do a lecture for my students. And I'm all set up to lecture capture at work, you know, um, but my laptop was at work, my uh, microphone was at work. So I usually lecture capture with my laptop and with this little wireless microphone, you know, you sort of plug this in and, and hang this up and you can walk all around and your students can, uh, um, you know, you can not be tied down to your laptop and it will capture your, your lecture for you. But I didn't have any of that equipment. And so uh, my first thought was, oh, maybe I can walk down to Radio Shack and buy a microphone. Maybe I can um, use my desktop to do this. And so the good news about this is that this can be set up in about 10 minutes on uh, equipment at home that didn't even have it before. And I think that's what, um, what ultimately successfully worked. The big question was the microphone. And so we actually had this for my son's uh, language learning for a computer program. It's just one of those little telemarketer headsets, but it's got a USB connection, so it plugs into the computer. And I think as long as the computer can recognize the, um, the audio input, that Camtasia can capture it. And so this is step one, getting some kind of uh, a USB microphone. I did not have to walk the Radio Shack, thanks to my son's uh, language learning. And then the other thing was, uh, I just needed the link to download the Camtasia software onto my, uh, onto my desktop. And uh, so I actually had a previous lecture done by, uh, by David Wicks uh, that, had the, that had that, so I was able to download it really fast. And um, the only other thing is I needed the file that I was gonna present from because of all the file sharing that we have going on, I was able to connect to that as well. So uh, the good news is, I didn't know I was going to be doing this. Um, I was able to get the lecture actually recorded and posted by 11 a.m. And the only weird thing is talking to a screen rather than talking to your students uh, and also feeling like you're a telemarketer with that little microphone in front of you. Um, and once you get past that awkwardness, it actually uh, worked really well. And so I broke up the lecture into several components. I, I don't like to do one big 90-minute lecture file. It also ca causes computer problems, it seems. Uh, so I like to break it up by topic. I also like to title each of them by the topic that it is, like give it a, a sentence title, something like that. And then it can actually go on iTunes U, and I see that a lot of the content that gets put up there um, just has the title of uh, like lecture two or something like that, you know? If you give yourself a, a title, you actually not only will communicate to your students better, but you'll actually communicate to students in general better. Um, and uh, the, the story I have about that is that I've been putting content, uh, lecture capturing and putting the content onto iTunes U for a while now. I have a student who came to me um, after finals, before I graded finals, so I'm not sure how much of that feeds into this. But uh, he told me that his dad was on a plane trip sitting next to a University of Michigan medical student. And the medical student, they got to talking about how his son was in biochemistry and the medical student was like, oh, I'm studying biochemistry and I'm taking this class. And I'm also listening to some lectures online. It turns out that this University of Michigan student who happened to be sitting next to my uh, student's father was listening to my lectures online. So you never know who's listening. I guess that's good and bad. Um, so the thing is, I've, uh, the lecture capture is a little bit more effort. A lot of the Camtasia software is automatic. Once I got it installed on my desktop, I just needed the internet connection, and it would actually download, process automatically. About 75% of the time, it works without a hitch. 25% of the time, David has to go back and kick it or something like that. 
But um, ultimately, uh, it's a system that's worked out really well for me. And I think that's the gist of, of my story. Are, are there any questions about like setting it up in a strange situation? Uh, the, the question, so the question is, um, did I e how did I contact my students to let them know that this was going on? Right. Uh, well, I used a Blackboard send email function immediately to let them know, um, don't trouble to come in, you know, don't like hike through the snow both ways. But uh, also, so there are some students who might have already been there, so I asked uh, the AA to put a sign on the door. And I tried to get the lecture up in time, just in case there were students who showed up and were like, why is nobody here? And then they checked their email. Um, there was actually a lecture ready. I don't know if any students actually did that. Uh, I just know that they covered the material however, however they did it. I don't know exactly. But they could have actually projected it in lecture and had the weird experience of my disembodied voice speaking to them in lecture. I also had a student, um, I wanted to encourage the feedback, which of course you don't get if you're just talking to a computer. I had uh, one student who emailed me two really good detailed questions. I'd like to think about how to get better feedback than one student asking two questions, but I figure at least it's a start and that student, um, I, I deliberately made a big deal out of those questions so that it was clear that that kind of feedback was encouraged. Uh, but that had to happen later, yeah. Uh, the question is whether I had any, any complaints I, that somebody didn't have access to the internet or computer and um, actually no. Uh, the good news is this was right before Thanksgiving break. There were tons of snow days afterwards and I think the students are connected enough that they see that that's not really an excuse, that it, it tends to work. Now, if I had had something assigned like for the next day or something like that, it might have been more of a problem. In this case, um, I didn't have any problems. Yes, I, I posted it on iTunes and, and on Blackboard. Actually, the way that I have it set up for my lecture capture automatically is that it makes, I think, four different versions of it. It makes a flash version so I can have a web link to that. It makes a, um, an MP3 version, which is just audio, an MP4 version, which is audio and video, so it has the PowerPoint on there. And I think there might be a, a fourth version that I don't even think about. So, but the thing is, there's at least three versions, and the link to the web version comes up automatically. So I was able to just copy that link into Blackboard, and that's the way it was able to be done by 11 o'clock. The one thing is, I have some, some kind of weird technical problem that sometimes causes an audio lag. It only ever happens for the very first recording. For that reason, that sometimes I make the first recording shorter. So if there's something wrong with it, it will matter less. Yeah, uh, yeah so as for, as for the, um, some of the equipment that I can speak to, and, and you can speak to some of this later, is there was a uh, technology grant that provided, I forget how many of these wireless mics, but they um, are sort of available for checkout for the quarter from Derek Wood uh, and myself. Derek coordinates the checking out. Um, so there are a couple of them. I think there's even a couple of them still available uh, for the, the wireless mic side of things. Uh, really, that's all the equipment that you need as long as you have a computer with a USB port uh, and an internet connection. That's, uh, the software was even able to run on my old Boeing computer, you know, the Boeing lottery. Uh, those are uh, antediluvian uh, computers, but uh, it was actually able to almost work even on that. So the power of the computer is not really that much of a factor. All right, thank you. And now David will tell you what it's really all about. <laughs> so appreciate Ben um, sharing that. Uh, he let me know right away after break that he had done that, and we talked about him just um, coming in and doing that. So <clears throat> we'll talk more about some of the things he suggested uh, as we go through the workshop. Um, here's a list of goals. So. Um, we we want to define what the the real issue here is for us. Um, I I don't know in terms of you seeing the description of the workshop, um, how you saw yourself using this technology, uh, but we want to um, encourage uh, uses similar to the way that Ben's using it. Um, he's probably our uh, poster child for. Um, really good lecture capture technology because he, um, the, some of the things he talked about, like the 20-minute limit and, and breaking things up in, in nameable, nameable sections are all good things. 
but not everybody does all of that. So we'll, we'll talk about what the issues are. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of terms, uh, flipping and chunking, that will be important. We'll look at a few examples. Um, and then we're talk, we'll talk specifically about the program that he was using, which is called Camtasia Relay. And that's the one that you'll have access to. Um, we'll discuss some of the challenges. He mentioned some things that he ran into, and we'll talk about some uh, other challenges. And then we'll also talk, when we define this term flipping, of other possibilities of things that you might use this technology for. So um, this isn't really a, a new issue uh, for people in terms of uh, uh, wanting to do something about the lecture. Uh, itself. People have been uh, complaining about lectures and wanting something changed in the classroom forever. And I want to make it clear that I, I'm not against lecturing. I think uh, it has definitely has its place. And I fully believe that direct instruction, uh, when it's done properly, is a, is a very efficient way to um, engage students with, with baseline information. Um, but we do have a problem in the classroom of uh, instructors uh, talking too much, um, that there isn't enough time for discussion now. Uh, maybe you uh, are in a situation where it's just, there's just so much content that you have to get through uh, that it just seems like that's the only way that it's possible to get it done. But what we're hoping to do is show you a way where you could still have uh, some of this content, but maybe um, put it at a different place in your course. Um, and, and then finally, we hope that um, maybe making some modifications would allow for uh, some more constructivist practices, uh, some inquiry-based instruction, or some more social learning types of activities that could take place in the classroom as a result of uh, making a change. And so in, in saying all this, um, lots of times we throw technology at problems and think that's, that's going to solve them, and, and many times it doesn't. Uh, but in this case, I think this particular technology um, can help, uh, help a, a professor um, actually flip what's going on in the classroom and allow for, or for more time for uh, other types of engaging activity that would include um, reflection or, or demonstration of, of uh, other techniques, that, other uh, items that maybe you have um, to discuss with the students. Um, and so by, by flipping, we are really talking about looking for ways where you might be able to um, use lecture capture technology to pull something out of the class and possibly make it available online. In some cases, it will be in like what Ben described in terms of a snow day, uh, making up for a snow day, or um, you know, in this next term, we have two Mondays that are missed with holidays. Um, this technology would work well for those. But also cases where maybe you have some type of activity, uh, a lecture that you give frequently, um, the information is, uh, pretty consistent term to term, but you get lots of questions about it. And you can quickly see that just by having that available where students could listen to it, watch you again and again as many times as they felt was necessary, uh, that you could actually then replace that in the classroom with something like a discussion about the topic um, and, and maybe not feel so pressed for time. So a couple of examples of this. Um, First uh, would be one with uh, Professor Ellis uh, in an ed leadership course. Um, he uh, was finding that he was having new doc students come in. Some were coming in from education backgrounds. Some were coming from other fields. And uh, even though he had a list of uh, readings that he asked uh, students to do before they started the course, he was finding that he was spending a lot of time uh, going back and covering uh, theorists that people who were coming from outside of education didn't know about, and those that were in education, um, you know, sometimes seemed bored by the topic. Like, why are we having to cover this again? And so he uh, was able to take lectures that he had actually recorded 
for a master's level course where he covered all these theorists. He was able to, to provide those to students, and he does it through iTunes U, um, and he also did it through CD-ROMs in the, in the, uh, CD -ROMs in the beginning and uh, just available in Blackboard. Uh, but he makes those available to students uh, in a way where they can pick which ones they want to, to listen to or watch. Um, and so it isn't a, something that's a required activity, but, it, but he's able to in the class, if he's talking about Dewey, uh, they don't seem to know about it, he can just refer them to uh, one of the lectures that he's given on that topic and, and move on. Uh, and so it, he's felt like as a result of this, he's getting better in-class discussion participation from these people that are coming uh, from outside the field when they're um, participating. Uh, the second example uh, is also uh, from an ed, ed leadership uh, course. Um, and in this case, the professor uh, <clears throat> needed more time uh, to present. Uh, the, the, he was given uh, a certain number of topics that he was supposed to cover in his course, and he uh, felt like um, he did, just didn't have enough time. Uh, he was meeting with these students, I believe, once a week, and uh, the amount of time that they were given, he felt like he had two more topics that he needed to cover. And it, it just, every time he was trying to address it, it just felt rushed. And he was, felt like he was cutting into the discussion time. Uh, and so what he looked at doing was taking these two topics, making lectures for them, putting them outside of the course. And then, uh, but he also, uh, besides providing the lectures, he also provided discussion boards where students could initially discuss what they were online. They could discuss the, the topic of the lecture. And then when they did meet in person, he said he was able to have shorter, much shorter, like 20 minutes of follow-up discussion on each of those topics. And so he didn't ever tell me exactly the time savings, but he was able in that 20 minutes, he felt, um, to adequately cover uh, the topics that he, that he needed to deal with, um, you know, questions that he had on those lectures. So um, in terms of you possibly flipping the lectures, um, here's some, some um, possible tips. And we're, again, talking about using this uh, technology called Relay, Camtasia Relay. Uh, and so it, it would allow you in class or outside of class to turn lectures into um, chunks of uh, differ differentiated instruction. So uh, the way Ben is using it is, is a perfect example. Um, you know, he's, he's clearly going into the class and making determinations of where he's going to break lectures up and thereby uh, when students are, and he's working primarily, you know, all face-to-face -face students, um, he's not actually doing something other than for snow days where he's uh, taking lecture and making it only available outside of class. He's just capturing what he's doing in the classroom. And when he's doing that, he's, he's, he's putting himself in a situation where he's providing these students with uh, chunks of content that they can individually go back and, and watch or listen to um, based on what their needs are. Uh, so not everyone struggles with the same topic. And by breaking it down, he's not having someone have to search through a two-hour file to try to find 15 minutes where the scaffolding for them broke down and they, they were no longer learning. They needed, they needed some additional support. Um, and so he's, um, he's been pretty satisfied with that. When we first started having professors podcast, we had a, several professors that did, you know, if they had a three-hour night class, they posted the audio for that entire three hours. And when we talked to students, um, they were letting us know that they weren't really, um, they, weren't, they weren't listening to it because they couldn't find. It was taking them more time to find the part where they wanted to start listening than it was uh, for them to just ask a friend, can I see your notes? Because I have this hole in my notes that I need to fix, and I, want, I, I would like somebody to um, 
you know, help me figure out what I'm missing here. And um, so once, uh, you know, once we learn some better strategies, the, the um, whole pedagogy of using uh, this type of technology in the classroom has evolved. Uh, once we understood that better and made recommendations and people began to experiment that way, we're finding that, that students use this heavily and um, both Ben, Derek, and others that are using it on campus will tell you uh, uh, about the positive feedback they get from their students uh, by, by providing this. Um, it isn't a, a true instructional design model. The question is, do, do they have drop-off in attendance? And uh, different professors have uh, different um, uh, levels of interest or concern about that. So um, when we get to that, let's, let's, let's talk about that in more detail because that is, that is one of the first uh, questions and there's, um, there's definitely research both ways. Um, they, they can, um, it isn't a true instructional design model. So in an, in an instructional design model, there'd be somebody helping you uh, determine, an instructional designer would help you determine where the best places would be to break uh, the content up. Uh, in our institution, that's not a scalable model. So uh, obviously you know your content and there's natural breaks where you feel like you could break it up. Um, but some people are still posting hour-long lectures. Um, they're choosing to just do that and I, 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 it's still working. Students are listening to those. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, while you're providing this content outside of class might be your ultimate goal to you know, to m flip your course to where you can have some content outside, some inside, giving yourself maybe more time to do other to activities. Um, many of you won't choose that as, as your ultimate goal. Uh, but if you do decide that's something you do, uh, the simplest way to start is to just begin recording what you're doing now. And there might be another reason why you want to record it. You might be noticing already people are bringing recording devices to your classroom. I don't know if anybody's seeing that. And if that's happening to you, um, you may or may not, you know, how you feel about that um, is, is obviously up to you. But what people who are recording for the students are finding out is that students don't do that. And then you're in control of the recording. So how you want it to be, how you want them to access it, if you only want them to see it in Blackboard, or you want to make it publicly available to others, that's your choice. If it's done outside of the class, um, you may find yourself in a, in a or if, you, if it's done by the students, um, they may be sharing it however they share it. Uh, you, 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 you just don't know about that. So, and that's, that's something that's difficult to control. But again, if you're uh, providing the recording for them, what we, we tend to see is that no one, the students don't waste their time uh, trying to record it themselves. Uh, so, you know, we'd like to see this lead to uh, greater accessibility for the students of the content um, and then possibly um, by providing this, and especially if it's done in a way where they have access to it outside of class, uh, more discussion of the content that, that you're providing. So um, here are some of the, the possible challenges that you might face. Uh, first for you, the buy-in. Uh, what you're doing is you're already getting good course evaluations. Um, you're, what you're seeing on test scores or assessments you're giving is, is acceptable. Um, why do more work? Okay, why, why change what you're doing if what you're doing is already working? Uh, so that's, that's an issue that you might run into. Um, you might have a, strat uh, a challenge in terms of the, what, what you, um, how are you going to record this? And so I've already mentioned this idea of recording it in class first. Some people, if they start by uh, just saying, okay, you know what, I think I will. Uh, I've got, looking at what I'm going to teach this quarter, I can easily see, um, you know, five hours of content that I could provide my students outside of class and thereby use that class time for some, some cooperative learning or some other types of activities uh, where I'm having my students uh, work together rather than uh, listen to a lecture. 
and then you sit down at a microphone and it just doesn't come out uh, because you're someone who, when you're in the classroom, just immediately you're on and you're, you feel at home, you're comfortable, and you can just lecture there and it, and it comes out the way you want it to come out. When you sit in front of a microphone in an empty room, you, you struggle with that. Uh, so it may be the easiest thing is to just record some things in class and make this a longer term project, make it something that uh, maybe someday I'll get to where I provide some content outside of class. But initially I'm just going to work on um, just recording some of the content that I have in class and, and making it available to students. Um, uh, the storage location, um, this is a question that we would have for you. When we set this technology up, you'll let us know where you want it to go. So some people want it available so they can just send it to students by email. They just have um, a certain, you know, one-time use. Uh, we've had a number of times where a professor has just come to us and said, one time I'm going to be gone for, uh, for my class this term. I'd like to record one lecture. I'm not a Blackboard user. I just want to send out an email. Okay, we can help you set that up quickly. Uh, or they say, I want, to, I want to make it so I can put it in Blackboard every time. Or they say, I want to publicly make this available. Okay? And if they, if they choose to do that, we're big fans of open learning. Uh, if you've at all looked at iTunes U, it's grown substantially. We were one of uh, 16 original schools using it. There's hundreds now using it. There's um, thousands of lectures that are available uh, for students. You can use other professors' lectures. Uh, they can use yours. Your students can go out and find things. So, as Ben was talking about, a student on an air, or a student on an airplane using it. We we hear all sorts of of stories like that um, where people are are sharing uh, content. Um, but basically, in terms of um, concerns, uh, one of the first questions a pre professor asks is, if I start to provide this for my students, will my attendance change? In um, almost every study that I've seen on this, uh, professors say that it, it uh, makes s small modifications but nothing significant that they, they wouldn't probably already be seeing. So Lane at the University of Washington uh, did a study, and in her findings, um, she, uh, I think it was like 83% of the students had said that it was, I, I don't quote me on that one, but it was, it was in the high uh, 80s, or excuse me, in the high 70s or, or low 80s where um, students seemed to say that it wouldn't make any difference on their attendance in the course. Um, uh, and of those who were choosing to do it, um, likely those people are the people who would skip anyway. Um, one, the one study I saw where the person said that it made a difference was a person who only lectured. The classroom was from start to finish only lecture. And so, of course, when you provide the lecture, outside of class and there was no discussion in class, nothing else took place in the class except for lecture, then it only makes sense that you're giving people an opportunity for flexible learning. And so then the question becomes, do you care? Um, is that important? If, if your primary um, uh, mode of instruction in the classroom is lecture and people choose to listen or watch your lecture at a different time of day where maybe they're um, more prepared to learn, uh, is, that a, is that better? Or is the discipline a, coming at a 8 o'clock in the morning class or an evening class or whatever the situation may be an important thing for us to uh, instill in these students? That's a question you'll have to ask. So, I mean, of the professors that are doing this, I've had professors tell me um, they think that it's, you know, maybe changed 15 students' mind out of a class of 70 on whether or not they need to come every time. And of those, um, th there are people that are, they believe are either um, good enough independent learners where it doesn't matter either way, or they're the people who uh, would have skipped regardless if I was providing this technology or not. So the question is, are, is there a limitation on how many times? There is not. They can listen to it as many times. I mean, they're actually 
Um, they have the ability, depending on which format you use, you could be allowing them the ability to download it and put it on their own uh, mobile device um, so they could listen to it as many times as they want. And there's, um, uh, through the statistics, there's pretty good support for the fact that students listen to these lectures multiple times. Um, so they're, you know, as they're learning, uh, they may they only they may be only getting 40 percent of what you're telling them in a class period, uh, and then they go back and either reread the book or read the book for the first time, and you know look a few things up, and then more of it makes sense to them. And so the fact that they can listen to it over and over again is, um, you know, something that you couldn't provide them uh, the ability for you to just keep telling them over and over and over. Um, but with the technology, it's, it's easy to do. Uh, so uh, in terms of the tool that we picked for this, Camtasia Relay, here's some reasons why we have picked this tool. And, and Ben referred to some of these in, in what he said to us. Um, the ease of use, uh, it is really simple to use this technology. Uh, once you have it set up initially, it's just record, publish, repeat. Re so you're just going back and forth, record, publish, record, publish, record, publish. Um, and so you can do that multiple times during a class period um, or, um, you know, whenever outside of class, whenever you want. Um, some professors are using this when they get students' questions. So if your course is at all um, one where maybe you need to reference something online, it's possibility that you can just answer their questions um, while you're showing them something on the screen in your office. And then that answer to a student, uh, one particular student question could be used for other students as well, um, that you could share that link with other students. Um, it, it has been used in the past for people who are um, assessing student work. And so you actually create a recording uh, where you're maybe walking a student through um, your assessment of their work and you're actually uh, grading it and they're hearing your voice uh, instead of you writing all over their paper or their project. Um, which students, the, in the places where this has been, have been done, um, the student evaluations of that professor's assessment are, I mean, those professors have told us that it's, it's through the roof. I mean, they, they just feel like that, that's the most special thing anyone's ever done for them. Uh, to have spent that time. And for that professor, uh, the one who specifically is, is using this on a regular basis, um, he's told me that, you know, this is, he can't do it another way. This is, uh, he's, he's not comfortable writing on paper, uh, writing on the papers. This is his style. So while the students thinking, are thinking they're getting a very special treat, he's seeing this as really the only way he would consider um, doing this activity. Um, the other uh, second reason why we like this uh, particular software is every professor can, can participate or, excuse me, can create. Um, and so the software is free. So as Ben was saying, he had the software on his computer at the office, um, but he didn't have it at home. And with this software, you can download it anywhere. Wherever you're at, whatever computer you have, you can download it on. You can download it on a friend's computer. You have your SPU credentials that you log into it with, so it's not like you're, you know, giving away for Christmas presents or something. Um, but you, but wherever you're at and you have access to a computer, you can um, download the software, load it on there, and and use it. Um, so it's it works really well. You just need a computer and a microphone for probably around. Somewhere between twenty and fifty dollars, you can get a, 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 a decent to good microphone that would be quite adequate. Uh, some laptops, the built-in microphone is good enough. Uh, others, um, it's not. It's it's uh, the quality would be kind of scratchy. It'll there'll be a lot of static um, on the the built-in mic, and you wouldn't want to use that. Uh, but we're happy to just sit down with you and help you assess what would be best. Uh, for your particular situation. And then you only need a, you need a high-speed connection only when you're ready to upload. So we've had people who live on Whidbey Island. They actually record their lectures at home when, uh, when they're at home at night, 
and possibly their internet connection isn't very good. Um, but when they come to work with their laptop, as soon as they get on campus, open the lid of their laptop, it uploads their lecture uh, to the system. Um, so it is possible if you got stuck in an airport somewhere and didn't even have an internet connection, you could record something. As soon as you got off the plane and had your internet connection, uh, it, would, it would be uploaded. Okay? And then everybody can participate. And by this, it's, it's, uh, we're referring specifically to the students. So you possibly, depending on the program you have, you may know what kind of technology your students have access to. And so this technology can be delivered in whatever format is common to your students. So if you know your students are iTunes users, you can deliver in iTunes compatible formats. If they're um, Flash users, that can be uh, delivered in that. If you're unsure, we can help you make that determination. But it'll, it'll work on all, all platforms. So here's kind of what it looks like uh, if you were to see it. Um, the presenter is um, recording. So whatever device you have to record on, uh, laptop, PC, Mac, doesn't matter, um, you're recording. When you finish with your recording, um, it's then uploaded to the server. And that process, the one thing you need to make sure of is when you finish, like let's say you were recording in a classroom, um, the, the podiums have the software on it. Uh, you wouldn't want to shut the computer off right away. Okay, So you wouldn't want to close the lid on your laptop, go catch the bus, um, and, and an hour later get home and wonder why the file never got finished uploading. You, if you uploaded it um, and then went back, if you finished in class, went back to your office, opened the lid, within a few minutes it would go up, it would be up on the server. But you have to give it a little bit of time uh, to get loaded up to the server. Once it's on the server then, it's like you're in a, 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 a line at the grocery store. And it's a queue system. So, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you're in a line with, uh, you know, 10 people and it's the next one in line gets to go and they're get, getting checked out and then they're on their way. And it works the same with this. There are, I think, uh, three uh, uh, checkout stands, if you want to call them that, available. And so if you uh, post your lecture and there's a check -in stand, checkout stand available, your content then gets converted into the format that, that you've asked for. So if you've asked for it to be made into uh, an iTunes file, then it gets made into an iTunes file. In Ben's case, he was asking for files to be made into multiple formats. So that's going to, that's like him occupying three checkout lines or having it wait in line three times. And uh, each time it's finished, it will um, uh, send you a message saying that the content is now ready. Uh, so you can, you can have that. We'll show, what, show you what that looks like. And then once it's finished, um, if it's for iTunes, we uh, will help you upload it to there. If it's Blackboard, you'll get a link, and you'll be able to take it to um, directly to Blackboard. Um, and uh, there are other formats available that we can, we can also discuss. Uh, the question is, do we have to choose which one we want? Yes, you'll tell us at the beginning which one you prefer, and that will be a profile that you get. And if you later decide, you know what, I think I want to put it on Blackboard, but I also want to put it on iTunes U, we'll give you an, another profile, and you'll be able to work with that. And the profile will, you'll put it one place, and it'll go all three if, if, you, chose for, if you choose to do that. So here's the basic workflow um, that what it looks like when, when you're uh, going to start this process. You're going to... Um, open whatever software on your computer that you want on your screen while you're beginning, okay? Now, when Ben came in here and talked to us, um, he, I asked him, do you have any slides you want to show? And he said, no, I don't. So I just quickly made a slide that had his name and the title of what he was going to talk about, and that's what we saw on the screen. And if we were recording what he did with Camtasia Relay, you would see that slide and hear his voice in the background. That's the way it would have worked. So for you, it's the same way. If you're working through a PowerPoint, you would just 
put the, open up the PowerPoint to begin the process. If you're explaining something to them that's a website or a piece of software, you would open that up. And you can have multiple things open and switch around. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what you don't want to have open uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, but whatever you want on the screen, uh, get it open. And then um, you'll open up Relay. You'll open up the software. We'll show how that looks. And you'll choose a profile. Now, if you have only have one profile, that's what will show up. So if you've told us, I want it to go to Blackboard, um, it'll come up, uh, right now what will come up and say screencast.com and uh, that's where it's actually being stored at and it's a file that'll be um, privately stored uh, on a server. You'll get an address, a URL that you'll then paste into Blackboard to use and we'll show how that works. Um, and then you'll want to test the audio. You'll want to make sure that the audio is working, um, you know, just check one, two, just to make sure you're getting levels uh, when you record, and we'll show how that looks. And then you'll actually record the screencast. So you'll just click the record button, and you'll begin. Uh, you'll begin working. And when it's finished, when you've said, okay, that's uh, where I want to stop, you'll um, uh, trim it. You'll have the ability to trim it, which means you'll if you want to take something off the beginning and the end of the file, you'll be able to do that. And then you'll publish it. And once you choose publish, it'll go out to the server. And here is another advantage to this idea of doing it, having it broken down uh, into maybe two or three sections during your class, is because uh, once you say publish, um, it, that, that particular file is off to the server in, in the line at the shopping, uh, in the checkout line and so by the time you got back to your office if you had recorded three separate ones the first two would probably already be waiting for you uh, ready to, to post into Blackboard um, uh, and the third one would probably be done soon after that. We do encourage you to not um, put yourself in a position because you can't really control how long it will, you don't know how many other people are using the server so if you're putting yourself in a situation where, oh, I need to have this up in the next hour available to my students, there might be other files being rendered at that time. So you, you need to be careful not to put yourself in that, that situation. It, whatever you're seeing on the screen is what will be recorded, okay? So um, we'll, we'll show how that looks, and I'm going to actually do that right now. So um, what I'm going to do is go... Uh, out to the web and so um, here's Camtasia Relay and this is where you would go to download the software so I'm gonna have you go to this address um, um, right now so that you can start this process of getting getting an account set up okay so the the actual address to this is um, H, it, you just need to go to, I'm going to pull this up on this slide, hang on just a second. I'm going to jump ahead a few here. So the actual address is on this slide, which is, if you, you can just put in uh, uh, camtasia.spu.edu slash relay. And Camtasia is C-A-M-T-A-S-I-A. SPU.edu slash relay. So when you would be on this site, if you haven't already done it, you would type in your login just like you would um, to get into uh, Blackboard or onto your email, and you would click sign in. And the first time you do this, it might ask you to verify that you're um, using, that you have options uh, set correctly and it explains whichever browser you're using. It will tell you where to, to click. Like in this one, it's telling me to click on Tools, Options, Privacy, and I already have that done, so um, click there to log in. Okay, so if you're, um, you're looking at mine up here, this is giving you an idea of what you would see at some point in, in the uh, future when you would look at this. Um, what I'd want you to see is that it'll um, allow you to um, 
the, the web portion of this lets you see what you've done and it also lets you download the software. Everything else is done just on your computer. So you're not logging into this site to actually record. You're logging into it two times, one to actually use, uh, to download the software, but you also might go there to just check the status. So I'm clicking right here like on a presentations link and it's showing me um, uh, presentations that have been uh, made available, okay? So here's these, if I click here and look at um, uh, completed, here's it showing different recordings that have been made that I've done, okay? Um, and so that might be a reason to go here, but primarily the reason you'd come here is to click on this download recorders link. So that's what you'll need to do in your office or on your laptop or in your home. Go that download recorders link and either select the Mac or the PC version, whichever you have, um, and use that, okay? And so if I'm on this particular computer, I have a Mac, I'd click on that link, it save the file for me and I just run it, okay? So in a typical way. If you have any questions about installing it, um, we can definitely help you with that, okay? So once you'd have it loaded, uh, that would be, um, this is just the status of presentation. This would be once you've published something, depending on the location where you've published it. Okay. So um, I'm gonna, before um, we go any further then, you've got the software, everybody has the software now on your, your machine. And so I'm gonna show you um, how to uh, actually set one up, set up a recording for the first time. So um, I'm gonna open up, so Camtasia Relay is on your computer now. So you should be able to, to um, if you're on a PC, you should be able to just go down to start. So um, I'm gonna open it on mine. And so the very first time that you open Camtasia, it will want you to log in. So you'll, you'll do that. And there's a, a a link that you can check to have it remember you. When you are on your computer, you can actually check that remember me. And again, this will help you out when you're in the classroom. When you open up Camtasia, you won't have it a little, you know, one more place you have to log in before you do something. Um, and so then you can tell it to log in. And by logging in, that lets it know who you are and which profiles you have. Okay, so uh, up here we see a profile. And again, this profile is telling it two things. It's telling it what format do you want it in and where it's supposed to put it, okay? So when you click on that, the one that we're going to take is this one called screencast.com. This is, this is the case where if that's the only, this is the one we use for Blackboard. And if you said, you know, I really want to post these on iTunes U, we would give you a, another profile, okay? So that's a conversation to have after we're done today. If you want to put these files someplace else other than Blackboard, we can configure it in a different way. But that, for the testing of the workshop, this one with screencast.com is the, is the correct choice. And then again, the title here, I mentioned before, you could just put one, two, three if you wanted to, but if, um, uh, if you were, in the ones you're doing today, if you'll put somewhere in the title testing, um, you know, Camtasia, just so that we know this is a file we can eventually delete off the system. But that's where you put the title of, of your, um, the content that you're creating. The description is your choice, whether or not you want to put something in the description field, you can, uh, you don't have to. Uh, it is important down at the bottom where you see it showing you uh, the amount of hard drive space you have. Pay attention to that. Um, some of you may be on machines that are in their third year of use at the university and, and may have less space, but as long as you have green down there, you're, you're good to go. And then you should also note, you should see, be seeing levels on your microphone. Um, if you're not, then we need to configure your microphone. And so um, up at the top, 
you'll see where it says audio devices. Okay? And you'll be able to click on that. So you want to click on audio devices. And you can see on mine, it was actually not picking the right one for me. If I would have gone ahead, it was using my built-in microphone, and I'm actually wanting to use this wireless one. Okay? And so if I was wanting to use this wireless one, um, I, for these, you, you'd need to take them off. And on top, it's showing you like a red dot initially. And you need to push the button on the front and it'll change to now showing you a green dot. So you have three, we only have two. Okay. Yeah, it's just on my system. So I'm picking then this Revo Labs X-Tag is the right one for me to pick. Okay? And for you, you've got a different microphone, but you should be seeing levels on your microphone. The thing you don't want, if I pull mine all the way to the top, see how I'm getting red there? I, and when I talk, I test one, two, three, test one, two, three. If I start talking, I get, get some red there. That's going to that's gonna be too hot on the microphone. It's going to sound fuzzy, staticky for people. So um, these are pretty, the microphones we're using in here are pretty sensitive. But you definitely would want to test this. You, you wouldn't want to go in and record 20 minutes and then find out that it's either really quiet or it's you know, making people's ears bleed um, later on. Okay, but once you've uh, made sure you've got levels, you can click OK, and you're back looking at it. Now, some of you might be on a computer where you have two screens, like I am currently, I have um, uh, two screens on this computer. I have this screen and that screen up there. Right now, they're showing the same thing, but if they weren't, if you had two, you know, if you were in a, uh, office where there were two screens on your computer, there would be arrows here where you could tell it which screen it's supposed to be recording, and you could pick that screen, okay, um, and choose that. Now you're ready at this point to do a test. So this is going to, in a room full of people all recording, this will not be perfect, but what you'll be wanting to do is click that test button and then just start talking. And as you talk, you should see some levels. And then you can wait till it gets to 10. Uh, but if you don't, um, you can stop it and it'll, it'll let you do it. But on mine here, if I click play now, you're probably not hearing that very well, but I'm hearing it on my computer that you want to just go ahead and try a recording, try a test there, and if it is working, then you can just close the window. And then it's a case of, um, you know, toggling windows. And so, um, are, are you familiar with the Alt tabbing on a PC? If you hold down the Alt key, and touch the tab um, button. And on these uh, Macs, it's the command key and then tab. You can jump back and forth between things that are open. But you should also on a PC be seeing down at the bottom all the open things. But you'd want to have, once you have what you want open, you'd want the um, Camtasia window on top of that. Um, if we go back to the workflow, what I'm recommending is that you open the application that you want to record with. So you open PowerPoint first, you open the website first, and then you open up Camtasia. And if you do it that way, then um, Camtasia will be showing up um, over the top of it. This is what this is you know what you would be looking at when you were ready to begin would be whatever content you want in the background and uh, the window on top. And then it would be clicking record. And so I'll do a test here for you and then we can, we can individually practice. But I'm just going to click the record button. This time I get a countdown. It's counting down three, two, one. And as soon as it gets to one and it goes off the screen, I'm ready to go. And because I know later I can trim it, I can trim the front part off, I don't have to be on immediately, 
Okay, so there have been professors who walk into the classroom, get everything set up, and they go ahead, you know, not 15 minutes before class, but two minutes before class, they go ahead and start the recording. And then maybe somebody raises their hand before they begin what they want to record and says, you know, uh, what, what are we doing Thursday or whatever? Did you watch the ball game last night? And, and that's not stuff that they actually want to keep, just like what I'm talking about right now isn't what I want to keep. But when I'm ready to start talking, I just, you know, take a pause and then, I'm, okay, here's the new SPU website. What do you think? And go into my talk. When I'm finished with that, um, I'll need to get back to um, the recording. And there's several ways you can do that. Um, in this particular, um, on the Mac side of it, um, down at the bottom I can see Camtasia Relay and I can click on it and bring this window back up. Same thing with the PC side. You should see down at the bottom of your screen a window or uh, in, in your uh, status bar, you should be able to click on a link and pull that back up to the top. Or it may be the Alt tab to, sh to shift to the, to the you might uh, need to get out of your PowerPoint. If your PowerPoint's full screen, you might have to hit Escape to get out of the PowerPoint first. But again, remembering that when you're finished, you can trim things off the back so it doesn't have to end perfectly for you. So if I'm finished with this um, talk that I'm giving, I click Stop. And it comes to a, a preview mode for me. At this time, um, I could play it. And you can somewhat hear that in the background that um, it's planned. But for me, what I can do at this point if I want to trim is I can click on this trimming link and then I can decide, you know, so, so maybe I knew that, um, you know, 30 seconds into it was where I actually wanted it to start. And so if I, if I go to that 30 second point and I click on this beginning trim button, it will, that part of it will be taken off, okay? And you might have to listen to it to, to, for it to be okay. In some cases, you may not care. I mean, you may start it and maybe somebody asks a question that doesn't pertain to the lecture, but, you know, you're providing content to these students that they want to review before an exam and they're, they're, gonna, they're going to understand that there was something that was discussed for two minutes prior to the start of the lecture that, that's on that. I'd do the same thing at the end. I'd go to the point where I decided uh, that I didn't, you know, wanted to stop. Let's say it was right here. Well, actually, let's say I do it when I have that. See how I go from having that on the screen to not having it on the screen? So I go right before I have it on the screen and trim that part there. So what we're seeing in between the two pink bars is what I've actually want to keep. And so I'd come down here and click Submit. And as soon as I click Submit, it'll tell, well, usually it's not going to tell me that I've uh, trimmed 50% of what I talked about, but in this case it's asking me if I'm sure I want to trim that much. Um, and so it's going to submit that. That is going off to the server now. And so now I can, once, once it's gone, it tells it's complete, um, and it'll tell me that I can go on. And so now I'm ready for part two. So I go to part two, and everything's already set up now. I know that it's all working. I click record, three, two, one. Uh, I was actually going on to the uh, athletics site now and talking about the athletics website. And so we've jumped to that, and we're already recording. So we're off and recording again. And when I'm finished, I'm going to come down to the bottom, click it, and um, stop. And did anybody notice? Uh, well, I, I put in that part two. Um, and so now we've got a second part. Something else is already in the checkout line at the, at the grocery store uh, waiting to get uh, finished uh, checking out so that when I get back to my office I'll have an email saying here this is this is finished I forgot something I forgot a step 
And so it won't, if I submit it now, it will go ahead and take place, but what you'll get an, a message back at your office, it'll say, you didn't ever tell me how you wanted to do this. And so you need to, for me to finish this, you'll need to select a profile. So you could still do that when you got back to the office if you forgot. So I can fix it now since we caught it. I can fix it here. So I'll go back, take screencast.com, submit, and that one's off. Uh, you have to do it for each one because it, it's not sure that you want to keep using that same pro. Okay. And I think that's probably the case because there are times when there may be, a, like you, you want to do something different with it, um, but maybe I forgot to give you a profile. You could still submit it without a profile and we could pick the profile later. But if you want to do something else with it, then you need to just talk to me and say, hey, I, I really want my content to be on iTunes U as well and I'll give you a different profile. So YouTube would be a different one as well, and if it's a YouTube private account, then we'd, um, we'd, we'd set it up so that it would work that way. Um, what it would have, it would make you do that. We would say uh, in the profile that it's a user-defined account, and it would, it would tell you to tell it what the, the log uh, um, With YouTube, um, the one thing that you have a challenge with is there's a limit on the size of the file. So it's like 15 minutes. And so if you record longer than that, it won't, um, you won't be able to upload it to YouTube. So as long as you're, you know that going in, then if you wanted to load these to your own YouTube account, that would work. If you wanted to use YouTube but you didn't want to have to worry about that, um, we could work with you and give you uh, the university YouTube account, which wouldn't be as automatic. It would work a little different, but you and then you'd be posting to the university's YouTube account instead of your own YouTube account. So there's that's again something to discuss. There's lots of options for where these uh, files could be delivered. We'll come from Instructional Technology Services. Okay, so here's what the email will look like. So it comes back and it's from uh, Instructional Technology Services, sent it to you, and it'll say presentation published, and I called mine testing Camtasia, okay? And so here's what I'm seeing, and I, I uh, presentation was recorded, and I didn't include a description, so it's not there. It tells me it was 47 seconds long, and right here is the link, okay? And so what you would do at this point is you would right click on that link, okay? So you see view right here, this little link here. Right click on that link and copy link. It's gonna tell you something. Copy, your browser will say something. Can somebody check on the, on the Windows side and tell me what it uh, says if they look at their email? Uh, it'll say something like copy um, hyperlink or something, but, but copy link location. You'll get a message like that. And then you can go to, Blackboard, and once you're in Blackboard and in your course, you can go to a content area, and any co a content area is one that has these menus, create item, build, evaluate those, those any of those um, are content areas, and in this case what I would say is build, and I would tell it to create an external link, okay? Say build, create external link, and here I would put in the name of the lecture that I have. It's still loading. Okay, so I'd put in, so I'm just going to say this was called lecture one, and then you would paste in the URL. So remember in my email um, over here, I right-clicked on that and I copied this link location and then I'm in Blackboard now. I paste that. So here's this big long uh, URL. And before submitting it, the one setting change that I would recommend you make is open in a new window. Okay? If you choose that and submit, and then if we played this here, it's, there's our, our content for us once it starts going. 
And then the nice thing about this is uh, if you are actually using a PowerPoint, it'll, uh, it can keep track of your slides for you when you're going through. It can chunk your content a little bit by slide. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's a few things I didn't cover in the, the PowerPoint that, that you have access to. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on these because you can read these for yourself, but there's some basic tips. Um, and pretty much the, the bottom line is you want to make sure whatever you're showing on your screen is what you really want to be showing. So sometimes when we're working on our own computer, we've got this message flashing at the bottom of the screen reminding us that we need to update our software. And when somebody's watching a lecture and that's like flashing at the bottom, it's, it's distracting for them. So if that's, you know, you'd, you'd want to make sure that anything like that was gone from the screen. Um, and anything that you can do to prepare the students, if you are showing a PowerPoint, if you can start it by saying these are our goals, um, something that gives them some indication of w w what's what they're expecting. Now, um, the length of it will obviously help them a lot to, to see what they're in for. But anything that you can do to um, uh, prepare them for what what's what's going to happen is is um, uh, really good. And if you are going to do these, let's say you're going to do ten in a term. If you, you do plan to do these at home or something, if you can try to keep the same settings that you have, so your screen uh, resolution, you, you haven't changed computers or you're not, you know, one time you've got your microphone just blasting them and the next time they just have to be like this in order to even hear what you're saying. Um, those, are, those are just some basic things. In terms of narration, if you're doing these outside, um, you may want to consider a script. Uh, most people, if they just have some bullet points to follow, that, that works for them. Uh, you may find that if you're doing this outside of the classroom, that you want to practice multiple times um, to get it where you want it to be. And so that, again, leads you to making shorter recordings so that if you decide to do it over again, it isn't very long. Um, and any time you can eliminate exterior noise, uh, the, in these rooms the fans are always blowing. Um, so anything you can do to r remove exterior noise is, is uh, a good way to go. Um, we've gone through the, the getting started. I think you have um, pretty much what you need in order to uh, get this to work. Uh, we've gone through what this workflow to, to show you how you would get it set up. We've talked about um, how you access your content. Uh, you'll get this email and you'll be able to copy the link into it and recommending that you open the content in a new uh, window. Um, I'd like to have, uh, finish by just encourage you to think about other possibilities for this technology. Uh, so uh, if you're currently spending a lot of time having students give presentations in class, if there's presentations that you could maybe move online, um, I would consider it. It's, it's something that we're seeing more and more of. So we're not talking about this not being a skill that they couldn't benefit from having practiced in college. Uh, we're seeing lots of YouTube videos uh, where people are giving lectures. So um, if you saw this as an opportunity where maybe you were taking two classes to give student presentations and instead of doing that, students um, posted them online, uh, it's, it's a possibility. Uh, you might look at this as a way to give reflections. So rather than even doing this in class, maybe when you get back to your office and you think, you know what? there was one more thing I should have shared. Or, oh, I now see what that student was talking about. I, I didn't understand what question they were asking. Let me take five minutes and I'll just talk about that topic, post it on Blackboard, okay? Um, it's a way to con continue the conversation, a possible um, a way to maybe actually get more time when you get back to class and the first 15 minutes is taken up with these questions that you could have maybe settled 
Everybody could have had peace of mind during the week or before the next class period. Uh, any kind of software demonstrations, if you have lab software that you need students to be able to understand, uh, rather than having to demo it in class, this would be a good possible way to, to capture that time. Um, you may decide to ca capture any conference presentations you give and then have your students watch that, uh, watch a, a presentation you give at a conference as part of a, uh, an assignment uh, for yourself. If nothing else, um, share that on the fact staff news um, so that others could, could see what you've uh, done. And then don't, um, don't uh, or do consider using uh, open educational resource content from places like iTunes U and uh, YouTube uh, slash edu. Uh, there's lots of great lectures out there uh, by uh, Nobel Prize winning scientists, educators, uh, professional, professionals of all fields uh, that, that you could share as content, uh, put a link in Blackboard and have students um, uh, view lectures or content from other professionals. So we'll finish there. If anybody has any questions, um, we'll take those. That's a good question. What, if I don't have anything opened while I'm um, giving a lecture, what do students see? They'd see your background. So that's fine, yeah. But but you could easily um, you could easily go to uh, um, something like Google, you know, uh, and you were going to talk about cats, and you just uh, put up a picture of a cat, yeah, adorable cat, and and make it so that it's uh, the full screen image. I mean, you could have this. Uh, maybe not, maybe not that, but um, but but you could you could put something up if if you didn't want them to see your desktop. But there would, and uh, the other thing is um, it can just be audio, uh, so you could choose. We could give you a profile that when you wanted to do something like that, you could just make it audio. Uh, um, so is this going to increase students' expectations? I I mean it can. I mean the. Um, you know, the, the people who have started to do it um, don't necessarily find a way to stop. So I think, I think once students know that this is something that you're doing, then they, they like it and they want it. And don't get me wrong, I want to be accessible to my students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is, this is uh, though I think um, I ha I've had two professors try this idea, um, and, and one of them e even coined a term, which I'm, I'm not going to share because it was a really good term, and I, I want to leave them to um, profit from their, all the workshops they're going to do on this. But, but they both were practicing this idea of when they got back from the classroom, they just closed the door, sat down immediately, and recorded five to ten minutes of what they would have said if they would have had five to ten more minutes. Because there were, the, the class was left with questions, and they weren't the kind of questions that you want people to reflect on and, and think about during the week. They were the kind that were like, I'm going to send you an email as soon as I get back to my dorm room because you should have told us this. And so they, they get that kind of content out of the way, and um, they reduce the number of emails is what they're thinking. So <laughs> it can't be good. OK. Anybody else? OK. So um, let us know how we can help you um, get going. And we'll do that. And if you think uh, you're not ready for this, another time, maybe.